want to um, welcome everyone uh, online and uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to, respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm on Kondamuka land down in Wynnum. Um, uh, we have this week uh, had the first year anniversary of the referendum um, uh, result from last year and um, uh, Mikel is uh, and always has been um, in support of constitutional recognition and we continue that support. Um, I want to welcome you all here to discuss the Mikel report, Bridging the Gap. Uh, it is a really fantastic report. Um, we're really grateful to um, our fantastic uh, lead author, Joe Lampert, who is joining us here today. Um, and our other guest speakers are going to talk to parts of the report, um, the meaning and, and what it means for um, the sector. Uh, I will introduce our panel before we um, start. Jo Lampert is the lead author of the report, uh, is a professor of social inclusion and teacher education at Monash University and over many years she's taught in mainstream schools, prisons, alternative education programs, remote Indigenous communities and universities both in Canada and Australia. Zan Bradford is uh, Branford, sorry, is the father, husband, brother, state school principal, and an advocate who seeks to make tomorrow better than today. Zan has taught and been a school leader in state schools throughout Central Queensland, Southwest, and Brisbane Metropolitan. Um, he's also a QTU principal union representative. Kelsey Hawthorne is a secondary school teacher in. Um, at a large school in the greater Brisbane region that has an ICSEA rating of 951 uh, and where 43% of students are from families with language background other than English. Kelsey is a former RTIE Academy tutor assisting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in years seven, eight and nine with their literacy and numeracy skills. Kelsey is a union workplace representative and an elective branch delegate to QTU State Council. And Kate Rudderman, um, is the General Secretary of the uh, Queensland Teachers Union, uh, one of the biggest unions in the state. Uh, Kate began her teaching career as a high school teacher of economics and English, which has been the general, um, and you have been the General Secretary since the beginning of 2021. A union pioneer, Kate is the first woman to hold the General Secretary role. And in 2010, was also the first woman to join the QTU Secretariat uh, when you were elected the Deputy General Secretary. Kate is a trustee, a member of the Australian Retirement Trust Board. It is one of, I think it's the second largest, if not one of the biggest um, superannuation funds in the country and is also the Honorary President of the Queensland Council of Unions. Um, my name is Sarah Morney. I'm the Executive Director of the McKell Institute uh, here in Queensland. The McKell Institute is a progressive uh, think tank. We look to identify challenges that are existing and emerging and identify policy solutions um, that, you know, that can help. Um, we run, we do research across a variety of areas uh, in Queensland. We're one of the only um, uh, think tanks that has a, a state focus. Um, most think tanks operate nationally. We have both the national and the state focus. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Jo Lampert, um, the lead author, to uh, talk about this report. Um, it is a report that stemmed from a report that we released in New South Wales um, that really identified that there was an issue um, in educational standards in New South Wales and, and outcomes. And when we came to the QTU um, and so said, do you want us to, what do you think about this report? Um, Kate was keen to get on board and, and sort of look at the Queensland perspective. Um, we yeah, engaged Jo to, to lead that research. So I might welcome Jo to make some comments. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thank you very much to the McKell Institute and the Queensland Teachers Union for inviting me to lead this report and to write this report. I should also recognize my um, co-author, Catherine Wilson. And I begin too by acknowledging that today I'm on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and those attending here today. It would be pretty impossible to have a conversation about equity and bridging educational gaps without prioritizing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who inform many of the systems best educational practices and as you say Sarah also on this first year of the anniversary of the referendum and to have a kind of a moment to think about equity in light of that referendum. 
So I was very, very pleased to be asked to contribute to the McHale Institute's Bridging the Gap report being launched today. For many years, I've been leading large social justice teacher education programs. And now, in fact, I'm leading research into teaching shortages and more specifically teacher retention. And I co-lead Monash's Education Workforce for the Future Impact Lab. We are all, I think, aware of the extreme teaching shortages we're experiencing, nothing like anything I've seen before in Australia. And in fact, um, although globally exacerbated by the pandemic, there are many reasons I think attributed to those teaching shortages. The education system is understaffed and under stress, which impacts educators and also obviously students and their families. Without question, the state schools in the most marginalized regions of Queensland and throughout Australia, be they diverse urban schools, regional, rural or remote schools, are most dependent on crucial school funding. And I kind of want to say that even though I'm in Victoria now, I did live in Queensland for 20, nearly 20 years. The impact of this funding is mo most profound on the children and young people who need a quality education most. But the doom and gloom narratives, a world where schools are branded as failing, hide something probably more powerful. Um, and that is that we all too rarely get to hear about the school leaders, teachers, education staff, um, edu education support staff, families, communities and students who thrive nonetheless and who do their work in difficult circumstances. So while we must pay attention to the insights of reports and reviews that spotlight areas of concern, we must earnestly question what is overlooked in these discussions. Too often we stumble upon platitudes promoting a narrow vision focus slowly, solely on vacancies and deficiencies and reliant on things that count as data and evidence, um, detail-laden reports while neglecting the fiercely dedicated individuals at the heart of this complex ecosystem, and that is the educators. The very pulse of Australia's education system vibrates within the passion, perseverance and innovation that educators daily bring to our schools, creating safe havens for our children's growth. We so rarely get to hear about what happens behind the school gates, the dedication, innovation, skills, and yes, the impact passionate educators have on their students. And that's why I was so pleased to contribute to this report with its focus on place-based uh, case studies. We could have included so many more examples um, of the powerful and creative ways Queensland schools use their funding to design school-based initiatives to work within and for their communities. Schools are alive with, with initiatives to improve students' literacy and, literacy and numeracy skills, but also programs in the arts, in the creative arts, um, and sport abound to create options for young people and open up their post-school options. They invest countless hours fostering an inclusive environment wherein each child thrives in all their complexities and diversities. So in my mind, it's essential that we center the narrative on our deeply committed professionals who navigate the waters of complexity every single day. Our classrooms are not merely places that deliver standardized content. We are not solely reliant on how we do on that very, you know, on, on NAPLAN, for instance. In our schools, we see new initiatives and daily practices that embrace diver diverse voices and cultural backgrounds. Schools are constantly striving to improve what they do. Equal and fair funding is crucial if schools and teachers are to be allowed to do what they do best, which is teach and care for our young people, support their well-being and prepare them for what feels to many at the moment as a as an uncertain future. So in light of the call for submissions to the Senate this week, which many of us are probably engaged in as well, um, the, the Senate's inquiry into better and fairer schools, we hope that this report is useful. Um, and we do conclude the report with four policy recommendations to increase the Commonwealth share of school resource standard payments to at least 25% to embed school autonomy and local consultation in expenditure of schooling resource standard payments, 
to develop a reporting mechanism that's both qualitative and recognizes school difference and which mitigates the workload of school leaders and teachers and to invest in collaborative time. If we aim for transformative, inclusive and compassionate education, we must empower our school leaders and teachers to flourish in living out their vocations. So we should cultivate policy frameworks rooted in trust and recognition of ec educators' expertise, honoring their professional wisdom by providing schools with the policies and funding they need to provide a quality education for all. Behind all the often negative press about the system in decline and the bad news stories, there is no shortage of actual evidence. If we look for it, if we know how to look for it, that school leaders, teachers and families are, and excuse the colloquialism, working their guts out, often in their own time, going above and beyond their school, their job descriptions to provide a strong education for their students. We really do, I think, need to look beyond narrow definitions of evidence to find out what's going on. So in conclusion, Sarah, just to close off here, I hope this report will contribute to disrupting the narrative and I hope it will fo foster solidarity for a quality education each child deserves. Thanks, Joe. That is fantastic. You were a, a pleasure to work with. Um, and your insights are really um, incredible. I want to welcome Zen um, as the principal representative uh, to give some of those inside the gate stories of inv invisible labour of school leaders supporting students' academic achievement and wellbeing. Um, Zen, if I can throw to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, look, can I uh, just acknowledge where we are here too on um, Trouble and Yagara country. I'm a very proud Wiradjuri Wawan man. My family come from down south and, um, you know, I'm very conscious and reflective that we do um, stand on those shoulders of giants and the work that's come before us. And I heard someone say last uh, last night as a part of a program that we are the uh, influencers now because we want our kids to go forward and be um, those proactive members of society as we go forward. Look, I'm the uh, I'm a very proud principal and have been a principal across a lot of demographics for a, a lot of years. Um, some very complex, um, very low ICSIA schools, uh, some very high ICSIA amongst the highest ICSIA in the in the state. Uh, the one thing that they all have in common is that no school leadership job is easy. And I think I heard Joe talk about there that, you know, school leaders and school teachers are working their guts out. And I, I certainly echo that. And I think you've got that 100% right. And we do want a, a school system where all children are thriving um, with the individuality that they bring with them. When I think about the invisible workload that sits within uh, the school gate, it was really interesting because, you know, I spoke with my my leadership team this week around what would you say the invisible workload is for you? Um, and so much of what they do, they feel they get caught up in the busy, you know, what the rush, the reactive, the, you know, I use a, a perfect example. I had a young person on my doorstep this morning who's starting tomorrow, who's coming from a complex case scenario. We've had to connect with ch child safety this morning. We've had to put risk management plans in place. We've had to contact the former school to see what the plans, what was working there. We've had to, you know, try and find these opportunities to connect. And so whatever was planned for today didn't happen because that child's success tomorrow is the most important thing. Now, I couldn't have planned that, but it is about prioritising the workload because, you know, if we're going to be the safe havens for students, um, to use the language that Joe used, um, we need to make sure that we're prepared and we're ready and we're not being reactive, but as proactive as possible. So those support plans, they don't just come out of thin air. And so often students go from school to school and that work, in some cases, yeah, it follows, but in some cases, students haven't been at a school long enough for that plan to have even been developed. And so the sharing of that information across is really tricky. Um, the time that it takes to connect those people up is really tricky. Um, the continuity of learning is really tricky. Um, I guess if I, if I springboard from those individualised support plans and those 
um, risk management plans that we develop for students. Another area is our, around our transition programs. You know, people think, oh, you know, when they think about prep, we think about all oh, the cute kids who turn up on day one and we get their photos and all of those other things. But the reality is the hours of work and the money that's spent to ensure an appropriate and successful transition for students to thrive. I've just had teachers offline today going out visiting kindies, taking notes on the students they've got coming to them next year so that they can more appropriately form their classes for next year, but also be prepared for whatever the quirks or interests or um, abilities students are coming with. That doesn't just happen, it has to be funded. And so therefore in our budgeting, we need to make sure that we've got money to do that at an already stretched budget limit. Um, that happens at both ends. You know, for, for some of our year sixes who are going off to, to high school for next year, they don't just go to high school and then everything's fine. There's a large number of students who need, you know, support in their transition programs. And the only way that happens is to release staff to be able to go with them to be able to have those experience both high schools back to primary and primary to high to be able to have those repeated experiences and then the plans that go with them to share that um, if that work doesn't happen sure the child turns up at be it primary school or high school but the success of this, their success rate while they're there it decreases significantly and we can avoid a whole lot of the um, settling in issues that children can experience and the anxiety and the stresses that they can experience by having appropriately formed transition programs. Um, my third point around invisible workload is around the workload that comes from our parents. We all know that parents are partners in learning. We all know that. If we work well with our parents in schools, we get the best outcomes for students. In some schools, being able to manage the frustrations, the complexities, linking students up. I've worked in schools where we've had to support parents with um, meal plans, um, link them up with, with, with different third party organisations, just to make sure kids could go home and get a decent meal at night. Now, we don't talk about that as a part of our role, but those children can't come to school and learn if they don't have their basic needs met. And sometimes the school is the only place that is able to advocate for those things to happen for some of our families. And at the other extreme, if you think about our high ICSIA schools with highly educated, highly educated parents, the demands that come on, on schools, um, uh, heaven forbid, you know, uh, parents come and they think that they, their child needs a, a private school education and they expect that, you know, in year six, they're going to fill out all of these references for you know, whatever high school program it might be they're going into. I have a lot of high performers and I always promote our public schools to our, our parents. And I've got a lot of high performers applying for academic merit selection processes. And none of those reports, no two of those reports are the same. So you have to fill those out, but the time it takes. And if you've got a cohort of even say 100 kids, you're filling each report out a certain amount of time. That's invisible work that people don't see. Um, but it's important for that child and for what their family needs. And we've been on a journey with those children as they go off into those programs. Um, I wanted to tap on um, next uh, around infrastructure and safety. As a safe haven place for schools, we need to have the best possible learning environments for kids. Yet the budget that we get and the work that we do in a school, we have to manage our learning programs our staffing in HR and our infrastructure in and around that. And if you look at the size of many of our schools, some of our smaller schools have the biggest sites. They don't appropriately get, you know, I've spent time myself as groundsmen in those schools, spending time on the mower because the, the grass is too long for the kids to come back on, on, on Monday and the groundsman wasn't paid over, the, you know, wasn't allocated over the holidays. So we've had to jump in and do that. The kids can't punk, come back to long grass. If they can't play and burn their energy, they can't achieve in the classroom. So management of those facilities and infrastructure, um, you know, it's it's a um, it's a revolving door of of workload and jobs that need to stay on top of. Even our most affluent schools have 
um, classrooms that are tired and that need to be upgraded and that has has um, safety risks uh, uh, evident in them. Uh, and that's our responsibility, but it's not a part that someone thinks of. Even the the call outs on a on a two o'clock on a Saturday night to your school grounds that's been um, uh, that's been broken into. Now you might say, where does that link back to teaching and learning? Well, the reality is, if children come to school on Monday and they witness that, their anxiety levels go up and their ability to learn in classrooms decrease. So we need to make sure those places are safe. So I think you know, in so in summation, when I think about what are our highest places of invisible workload, it comes into individual support plans for students, both behaviour and learning. It comes into how are we supporting transitions at both ends of school? How are we supporting parents and the partnerships with parents for children to succeed? And what's happening in the infrastructure and the learning environment space? And there's many of those tasks that people just think, you know, teachers, uh, school leaders are about teaching and learning or managing the behaviour in school. And none of those tasks are necessarily considered. So I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the workload. I think we do the best job um, in the world. I love working with our kids and I love seeing them thrive. Um, and regardless of, of what the challenges are, the energy I have every day to come and work with the great young people in our state is amazing. So um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share. Thanks. Uh Zan, I really appreciate that. We've also got um, Kelsey um, to provide some more of those insights from inside the school gates. Yes, um, I, I hate using the word um, I always try to pretend I don't know with that word, but I will say it a thousand times in this. I, following on with what Zan was saying, I'm, I'm, I've only recently stepped out of the teaching role um, within the last term. I'm currently a head of department, so I have feet still in both doors and it's shocking to hear the complexities across each level of teachers whether you are a teacher school leader principal we all share very similar issues but just in different contexts I spoke to several colleagues in the last few days in preparation for this and I just asked what would you consider is like your invisible labor very similar to Zen and I had a teacher reply with an email chain with a full list of everything that she would consider her invisible labours. And it was shocking because I wouldn't have considered half of them invisible labours, but when I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, they are. So one of the things that was brought up was mentoring and wellbeing, where we are, and especially in a secondary school setting, we can have upwards of 120 to 150 kids on our timetable over five days and even though you may only teach them for three days a week, you are their teacher for five days a week in reality. If you don't see them on a Tuesday, they could still come to you and say, Miss, I need to talk about something. I need to tell you something. And you take on that mental load and you pass on what you are supposed to pass on, but you still have to then worry about that child and you take on that mentoring and well-being check because you want to make sure that they're not struggling in class if that's what they came to talk to you about. So that toll of that invisible workload going on in the head is also trying to act like a counsellor, but they're not supposed to. It's not our job, but we are empathetic people. We're teachers. We care about our students. So we're going to go above and beyond to make sure our students feel protected. And I thought that that was something that was interesting, but also valid. We as teachers take on the load of our students in order to make sure that they are supported through everyday learning, whether it's in the classroom and social, emotional well-being, learning, career advice especially in our secondary space when talking about transitions some of us are responsible for tracking attendance as teachers which is something that you wouldn't expect teachers to have to do we would have truancy officers or attendance officers but we also have to then track their QCE points to see if they're on track to graduate we're then contacting home and monitoring our students in class and paying attention to their grades are they on track are they do they need support interventions do they need certificates and we're doing that at a classroom level on top of trying to do our planning and preparation that's one of the big thing that's um we think about is that mentoring capacity you're not just a teacher you're their role model and their mentor and you have to take that under your wing when you become a teacher but you don't expect it to take up most of your time Another thing that was important that fit right into that was then differentiation. In a high school setting as well, we have complexities 
surmounting in our classrooms. We have upwards of five students minimum in a classroom with complex needs and we're responsible for differentiating for them. But some of us don't have the training provided in order to actually meet the students' needs. And so they feel we feel like they're getting lost in the crowd. And if we're not spending multiple hours changing our resources and our lessons to support those students, we don't feel like we're doing the right job. And therefore, we spend more time doing it. And it's one of those additional tasks that is a responsibility of us as teachers. But at the same time, I have five students in a year 11 hospitality class that need significant differentiation, really should be on a QCIA pathway, which is an um, alternate learning program, but they don't meet the needs because their PLPs and the data and evidence collected in the years meeting up to that weren't uh, valid enough for them to be on a supported pathway. And so we're then doing the additional above and beyond work in order to make sure that they're on track. Uh, another thing is then with coming with our complex students is complex behaviours, the multiple um, hours after school during a week that you could be spending reporting and contacting home, all of these invisible labours that you spend in your weekly basis, having to make sure that your parents are contacted if a student has had a misbehaviour or an incident or an accident in class, how they're tracking with their assignments, all of these things stack up and your week becomes consumed with work. And weekends, I, I remember hearing a story of one of my colleagues that they would write all of their behaviours down on a piece of paper in their planner and then on a Friday night would go home and write all of their behaviour incidences into one school. And I, I just was shocked that that's what they chose to do on a Friday night, but it made sure that they had, their cognitive load was decreased throughout the week. There's so many other things in the current, when talking about funding and collaboration, equity and excellence, we, uh, as new technologies, we're trying to support students in the classroom with technologies, but at the same time, not every student has access to these technologies. So teachers are then planning digital lessons and digital resources, whilst also then having to do analog resources and then having to teach that simultaneously in a classroom where you have to do traditional teaching on paper and PowerPoint presentations to then have the resources digitally online and available for students that have got the access to the technology. Uh, you then have to then have time to build these resources and then also build the platforms in which you're going to store them. So with our Department of Education transitioning to an online learning platform and providing only one hour of PD for every teacher in the state, teachers are then taking time out of their own lives to do online PDs that are multiple hours more than what was allocated and stated within the program. And then they are then having to then build all of these without allocated collaboration time to do that with their other teaching peers and teaching partners. And some of these teachers, they don't, they have the pedagogy knowledge, but they may not necessarily have the technological skills. So whilst trying to build an effective online learning platform to allow for equity and excellence amongst our students, they also then may not have the capacity to build it effectively and require collaboration, but we don't have the funding in our school resourcing scheme to allow for teachers to go offline and build this platform. And there's a lot of things that come along with the invisible labours. I know I'm I'm guilty of spending my holidays doing all of my teaching and learning prep so that when I'm at work, I don't have to do that. I'd make that my choice, but it hasn't actually reduced my workload. It's just meant that there's more hours in the day for other jobs to take over. For me, it's meeting with external partners. I end up having to stay at school or be at home and be available online until five to seven o'clock at night because that's when they're available to speak to someone who's a teacher who's unavailable during the day. Or my personal favourite as a hospitality teacher is the invisible load of the functions, camps, overnights, excursions. I We're very um, commonly here from 7am until 9 to 10pm at night running functions for students in order to get their cert signed off and have their shifts covered and we do that because we believe that they have that chance to succeed but at the same time it takes a toll when you're doing one every single week so there's so many different things I could go on for hours about all of the like invisible labors but in reality we as teachers we're not here from 8 30 to 2 30 we live this life and it goes around the clock but without proper funding 
we can't even alleviate that little bit of stress. Stress. I think that's about as much as I can talk about today. <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. That is um to you and Zan. They are some really um, powerful insights to sort of what it looks like day to day, um, the challenges, the opportunities, but the the real challenges that exist. Um, so on that, I might welcome um, General uh, QTU General Secretary Kate Ruderman um, to talk about, you know, what it looks like or, or why we need to see full funding for state schools and TAFE. Um, so Kate, I might welcome you. Thanks, Sarah, um, and thank you for acknowledging the traditional owners, and thank you, Zan, for acknowledging the traditional owners and lands we are on, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I'm really fortunate to have um, been born on these lands and raised my family on the northern banks of the Maywa. Uh, I'm also very, very aware that um, I've got, I'm very privileged at um, my children having experienced public education and um, having had the success they have had because of the fabulous teachers and school leaders that they've had the opportunity to work with in the time that they were at school. Um, I also want to thank Sarah and Joe for the opportunity to partner um, with the McKell Institute and Joe for working walking working alongside the QDU uh, throughout the drafting of this report. This is a report that represents the QDU's interests. Um, that is the interests of the teaching profession. Um, it stands in contrast to other reports, including those from governments like the Wiltshire and Donnelly Review of the Australian Curriculum, Christopher Pine's Action Now Classroom Ready Teachers, and the Malcolm Turnbull version of Gonski School Funding, Gonski 2.0, which enshrined in legislation a 20% funding cap on SRS payments to public schools. And while the proposed legislation before the House might make that 20% funding cap a 20% base, the reality is that by just making it a base, there is no initiative or no incentive or no what there's there's no motivation for a federal government to extend their funding contributions to Queensland state schools or to state schools across the country um, to the 25 percent that is necessary to ensure that um, our students have 100 percent funding to meet their needs. The original Gonski review was um, con was conducted in 2010. Um, and the original Gonski girl, there was a photo of, of a Queensland student. The original Gonski girl has been out of school now for two years. And the preppies that were also part of those Gonski um, campaign are now in year 10. They're about to go into year 11. So a whole generation of um, public school students have gone through underfunded um, and without funding that's designed to meet their needs. Um, and a whole generation and the continuing generation of public school students um, have been successful relying on the invisible labour of our members. Um, what sets Bridging the Gap apart from other reports is that it recognises school education is in crisis, but it resists school shaming and teacher blaming. Too often we hear that it's up to the school leader to make it work or it's up to the teacher capability development. How many times is our profession being criticised for not being skilled enough to be able to meet the needs of the students in our classrooms and more investment in education of teachers or performance-based measurements for teachers and school leaders is the answer rather than actually filling the funding gap. We've heard Joe say that the pulse of schools is the passion of educators that schools are safe havens, that our, the dedication of, of educators, the innovation that they bring, the skills of educators are the things that actually make public schools successful. Um, Bridging the Gap recognises the invisible labours of Queensland teachers' profession amidst chronic underfunding of public schools, and the stories of Zan and Kelsey are not unique. These are stories of experiences that our members face daily. In fact, they've been playing out today inside the school gate and inside our state school classrooms. The report shows that Queensland's public school teachers and school leaders are doing the heavy lifting to bridge equity gaps that are created by government fund underfunding. And the stories of Zan and Kelsey today talk about the types of things that they do and understate the types of things that they are doing to bridge that equity gap. In doing so, every day we show in our schools and classrooms the possibility of achieving excellence and equity in Australian schools and the urgent need for school-based for the needs-based funding. 
Forget school shaming and teacher blaming. The greatest assets to Queensland public schools are the 60,000 teachers and school leaders working throughout Queensland inside the school gate every day. Bridging the Gap is our stories from our schools and includes case studies from Benoa State School, Whitfield State School, Polaris State School, Oakley State High School, Quarrel State School, Cairns West State School, Milpera State High School, Spinifex State College and Bersica Street Sky School. So it doesn't only focus on low socioeconomic areas within the southeast corner. This is a statewide report that provides us with a real opportunity to look at um, what is needed across our state to ensure that our kids who attend our schools have the best opportunities every single day. All of the data that is sourced from publicly available reports like school websites and government agencies. We see the transformational stories that is the work inside of state schools that transform young lives, develops the next generation and builds stronger communities. We see local decision making and benefits of investing in professional collaboration time. Through our stories, through the case studies and the Bridging the Gap report, we can see school education may be in crisis, but it is repairable. This report shows through needs-based funding, Queensland's access to education can become more equitable and its outcomes can rise to meet community expectations and world standards. Queensland now has an opportunity to reverse educational decline in ways that are affordable, politically achievable and popularly supported. The QDU endorses the four recommendations of the Bridging the Gap report, increase the Commonwealth share of school resource standard payments to at least 25%, embed school autonomy and local consultation and expenditure of schooling resource standard payments, develop a reporting mechanism that is both qualitative and recognises school difference and which mitigates workloads of school leaders, and invest in professional collaboration time. The QDU appreciates the works of um, the authors, Professor Lampert and um, Catherine Wilson. This is timely um, as the Australian Government are calling for submissions to the Better and Fairer Schools Funding and Reform Bill 2024. The QDU will be certainly citing this report now submission to Australian governments and, it, and to the Australian Government. And we've developed a guide to also support those who wish to make a submission. So if you're online and you wish to make a submission um, and tell stories, if you email the QDU at services at qdu.asn.au, you can request this guide. But be aware that the turnaround time for submissions is really tight. It's nine days. They're due on the 24th of October. Whether or not the federal government wants to hear our voices, we need to make sure that we have the opportunity to get as many stories as possible into this um, inquiry. And the reason that we need to do that is because we cannot, for another 10 years, have a base allocation of 20%, um, which has no incentive or no motivation to increase beyond the 20% that was put in place after Gonski 2.0 by, um, by Scott Morrison. So if you're wondering today how you go about doing it, well, Kelsey and Zan have shown you what you can put into a submission to um, the inquiry and the stories that they've told are stories that are not, while unique to them, are not unique to every workplace in Queensland. So these stories are powerful and they are necessary. Um, and this report gives a great example of the types of submissions schools can make as well. It is so, so important that we fully fund state schools within Queensland and across this country. We need to make sure that where students or parents choose to send their kids to state schools or have no choice but to send their kids to state schools, that the excellence of our teachers and our school leaders are recognised and that they are given the time and the resources that they need to continue to prepare our students for their future. Education is the greatest source of hope for anyone in this country, and we are the builders of that hope. So it is time that the federal government fully fund Queensland's state schools. That's wonderful. Um, quite a rallying uh, call at the end there uh, from the General Secretary, which is, you know, I always love that. Um, we do have, so we're going to go to a couple of um, questions now. We've got uh, one um, which sort of really, I think, ties in. There's a um, a why and a how. I think you've sort of answered the how. The how is to get active and 
um, to make submissions. But the question um, is, you know, whether a teacher's shortages compounded by ever increasing complex work and workload of teachers and school leaders, um, chronic underfunding of schools, why is it that education policymakers are not listening to these stories? Um, it's sort of the eternal sort of bane of your existence, existence, I suspect, but can you speak to that? Why is it that sort of the strategies and the policies seem so out of line with what the real experiences of the profession and the um, students are? Uh, sometimes we think it is that they don't see the importance of education as a political um, winner um, at the ballot box. Um, I think um, there's also a statement that Paul Keating made a uh, number of years ago, which was you don't get in the way of the state treasurers and a bucket of money. Um, and I think the same has to be said of any minister who's vying for allocations for funding for different projects that are occurring. Um, so why are the policymakers not listening? Um, I think that at some point in time um, they are, uh, think that they know better and it comes from a point of view of um, a government, whether it's this government or whether it's previous governments that don't employ one single teacher um, and who have, this government has taken the steps to ensure that our profession is heard on a range of different work for uh, a different um, uh, task force and um, in inquiries. But at the end of the day, um, if you're divvying up a pie, then they think that the 20% is fair enough and that um, that it is the state's responsibility to fund the remainder of it. But, you know, it's not the state's responsibility. The states also have to provide a share of their funding to private schools. So, you know, there's this um, degree of um, we'll do what we can do, but at the end of the day, um, kids don't vote but parents do. So we need to make sure that the voices of our parents are also heard. Um, and these are the kids of the future who absolutely have a see the value in public education. And I think that's the other part of it, understanding the value in public education. And the small target, the better target, the small target for them are teachers and school leaders. It's our profession. So um, calling into question the capability of our profession and blaming schools and blaming teachers um, for not using the funds that they are given to create the experiences that um, are there um, is an easier target than for actually saying it's our responsibility to make sure that every kid across the country has full access to funding that supports their learning needs. And I might um, ask this question to the teachers. There's a, you know, labour shortages has is um, are occurring across the economy, not least in professions, frontline service professions like teaching and nursing um, that have significant um, pressures in terms of working with and delivering for um, students and patients. Do you think that sort of blame game and the lack of funding is is part and parcel of why the profession is struggling to re recruit and retain educators? And in fact, I can probably throw that to all, but I might ask um, Zan and Kelsey and then Joe to comment on, you know, how hard it is to recruit and retain when the challenges exist. And on top of that, the blame um, sits there as well. So Zan, I might start with you. Perfect, no worries. Thank you, I was trying to be polite. Um, happy to um, happy to talk to that. I, you know, I think recruitment and retention is, is a really interesting point because um, I, I think both go hand in hand. And and I think when we talk about funding, I think you know when you think about the amount of out of pocket expenses for a, for a teacher and what they spend funding their own classrooms and their own resources and their own things, I think you know there's an expense that you know. Should if schools were fully funded, teachers wouldn't have to do that, and they wouldn't feel like the the profession was least attractive. I think it's you know the elephant in the room is that we've got an issue with getting teachers statewide, and that teachers know because we've got a shortage of teachers, there's a little bit more reluctance to engage in HR. But then the, in some of the HR processes, I know a lot of my colleagues are engaging in staffing through Facebook as opposed to through HR. And the reason they're doing that is because 
the the system and the process isn't working for us and we don't have the hours in the day to be sitting and chasing um hr up around are they doing their job so sometimes you know um if you look at those queensland teachers facebook pages and recruitment pages that's schools everywhere are using this as a recruitment drive and they're getting teachers so teachers know that they can because there's no incentive for teachers to go and do um rural rural and remote or there's no incentive or the 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 uh, incentives that are there aren't understood um or promoted enough um because this the system's not working for us where recruitment and retention um is 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 sort of spoken about and and even even things as simple as even schools in southeast Queensland, even metro in and north schools, highly attractive, struggling to get teachers because, you know, people are dabbling in what the private system has to offer because there's some more perks there. And yeah, the hours might be long, but I've got a I've got more I've got more um I get more out of that employment. Whether it's right or wrong, that's the rhetoric that seems to be out there. Um and what we what I've seen in a personal experience is that um, often the culture shock is different. People love the cultures in our public schools, but we need to do something to find more than just the culture and the environment as a rewarding place and the camaraderie that we get. It needs to be a financial incentive too for, for teachers to be teachers in our great public schools across the state, not just in, in select areas. And if funding was allocated accordingly, um, I think we could see more done to address this teacher shortage and not just try to attract people to the profession, but to retain those who we know who are out there to stay in our great state schools. Thanks, Dan. Um, Kelsey? Uh, when it comes to the teacher shortage and the complexities, especially around retention and like, well, attainment and retention, like keeping our teachers, there's so many different layers to it I, I i'm from a hard to staff region uh with some of the largest schools in the southeast corner and we have graduate teachers becoming mostly the force of our like that that's our teaching force we get graduate beginning teachers regularly and the burnout that they that they get in their first year we've had several staff already leave this year, apparently, I, I found a, I heard a story of one that taught for a day and never came back because it was too hard. And so there's always that another issue where it's like, well, are our universities preparing our teachers for the complexities of the teaching environment that we have now? And then on top of that, there is no financial incentive, just like as Zan was saying. But to me, it, it, I need more than just financial incentive. A lot of teachers need time and like they need time resources. So it, it's the, the complexities around the teacher shortage and the blame game. There's nothing, there's no one to blame bar the lack of funding and the lack of support that we've had in order to transition into the new complexities of what the world is. We, after, through COVID, it, it, the, the teaching world had already started to change and shift and COVID exacerbated the outcomes of the complexities that we were getting with our students and changed our teaching, our teaching environment. So when it comes to the teacher shortage, we need incentives that aren't just going to be about financial incentives. We need things that are going to make sure that teachers' work-life balance can be balanced in some capacity. I don't believe that it's 100% attainable no matter what career you're in, but I do believe that there need to be incentives in here that support our teachers' new um, experienced retiring teachers, tracer teachers, in order to want to be in the classroom, especially in our state schools. One of the reasons I've stayed at my school for so long is because of my students and the opportunities I have here to teach. And some people don't see the value in it because it's an environment that they weren't, that their teaching career wasn't developed in. And so there needs to be some sort of incentives provided, but it's not my, it's not our teacher responsibility to do that. And what Zan was saying, where we're funding our own classrooms. I, well, I was told today that a, one of my departments wasn't able to get pens that they needed to purchase their own. 
because we didn't have the funding to purchase the stationery. And these pens are for our students in a low socioeconomic area where students don't always have pens because that's not a priority purchase for their family. Yeah. It's simple as that. Um, Joe, did you have some thoughts on that? Uh, you're going to be sorry you asked because I'm going to have to restrain myself and I won't talk for three hours. I'll make three points if I can. I could talk forever. Um, one is, I don't know if anybody in this room probably remembers that I went a little strangely viral about two years ago because I very casually in some ways on Twitter posted something that said we have no lack of teachers. We just have many, many teachers who no longer want to work within the system. And that viral tweet got like hundreds of thousands of likes from all over the world. It was just a bizarre moment in time when I got famous. But um, there is somebody named Doris Santoro who talks about demoralized teachers. So I think the blame, the constant blame is, is demoralizing for teachers. We wouldn't do it to our doctors, but we do it to our teachers. So that's the first thing I'll say. I do want to throw in that um, teacher education gets also incredibly blamed. Um, and I think that's because for the Fed, you know, for the Commonwealth, it is their lever. So teacher education also gets a lot of this blame. That's my second point. And my third point, I think, is that I think policymakers don't get it because um, they are understandably, perhaps, um, looking for the quick fix. Can we talk about the numbers of teachers we can attract into the profession? Because it's a much harder ask and a bigger issue to deal with the retention issue um, in a lot of ways. So getting teachers in the door seems like a fait you know, like the end point. Whereas I think the issue of retention is a is um you know a different kind of issue. Wonderful. I'm um, unfortunately that's gone very quickly. I'm going to have to wrap it up because I'm getting the message from uh, the online uh, uh, chat that um, it's going to it's going to end soon. So I really want to thank our speakers, Joe, uh, Zan, Kelsey, and Kate. Um, this has been a really fantastic conversation. It's been recorded, so I suspect um, the, the Teachers Union will be um, providing this as a resource, sending it out to members. We'll also, at Mikkel, uh, be posting this online. I really want to thank Joe again for your work on this report. I really want to shout out uh, Dr Craig Wood, who is um, has been a champion of this project uh, from the Teachers Union side and, and really facilitated um, those incredibly valuable uh, stories from the, you know, behind the school gate um, and to the QTU for your support to Kate and, and the executive. Uh, thank you everyone um, for your time uh, and, you know, good luck with this campaign. Um, you know, what is it, nine days to get your stories in. So make sure you make those submissions. We'll certainly be supporting um, everything that we, uh, you know, put into this report and those really strong recommendations. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.